I mean, you might have to That relates it to the idea of accumulation. Okay. You have to talk about x varying to talk about the accumulation function accumulate. Okay. And then we define this function r. What is r? Casey? R is the rate. 
Well, or, oh no, R is um, the slope or the constant rate at that time. And at that point. At what point? The x interval. Okay, all right, that, you got all the main ingredients, okay? <clears throat> let's, just, let's expand it a little bit so we say the whole thing. R is a rate of change function. It gives the average rate of change of the accumulation function. F over the interval, over what interval? Jordan, it gives us an average rate of change of the accumulation over what interval? The interval of 0 to infinity. No, not this one. The accumulation function gives us uh, change of x. Say that again. The interval of that one change of x. Okay, and so describe that change in x. It's from what to what? From the left endpoint of that change in x to. Yes. To okay, good. Did everyone hear? Just did you hear what? Could you say it too? Um, change in x from the left endpoint to the right endpoint. Okay, so it gives us the average rate of change of the accumulation function over the interval, and I'm going to use this notation. Okay, square brackets will mean the closed interval. So, over the interval, starting at left x and ending at left x plus delta x. Okay? So that's the, that square bracket notation means the interval starting at one place, ending at the other, including the endpoints. Okay. What is, notice down in the definition of left, just like always, we said um, um, that this is with respect to some value of A. What role does A play in this? Zochi? It is the start point. Say that again? It's the start point. It's the start point of what? It's uh, graphing the function. Well, yeah, sort of, but it's a start point of something that's conceptually important here. What do we always use it for when we're talking about accumulation functions? The um, left endpoint of an X interval. Not Change quite. Accent. Yeah, not quite. Anybody else want to try this? Give just a second, Greg. Right? John, what did we use A for when is we were that, talking about? Yeah, is that where we started measuring? Yeah, that started measuring meaning? <coughs> distance from the origin? Or? Uh, not distance from the origin. That's where we started the accumulation. No. We said the accumulation function is going to start accumulating from A. And then that, because we always, when we went to the integral form, we went integral from A to X, right? That means we're starting the accumulation at A. Now, A, let's look at, so the value of A is Okay, this isn't entirely accurate, but it's good enough. Okay? It's where the accumulation function starts accumulating. Now, right now, I've got A being 100. Okay? Or negative 100, I'm sorry. So, the accumulation function is starting from way off screen, right? But we're going to be talking about delta x for x starting at 0. What sense does that make? Does not So to talk about the accumulation starting from negative 100, but we're only looking at x from 0 on and the delta x intervals from 0 on. So we're like only looking at the accumulation from x not quite. We could, the accumulation is from wherever A starts, but we're only looking at the rate of change from zero one. You see? That's why 
A can be way off the screen, and we just ignore it because we're looking at the rate of change over delta x intervals of starting at zero. That's where we're looking at the rate of change from zero. Now, in terms of a, a square, it doesn't make any sense to talk about starting the accumulation at negative 100. But in terms of what we've got up on the screen, we can start it from anywhere. In terms of just the, map, the symbolism, we can start it from anywhere. So let me do this. OK, let's see. Do we have a value of delta x here? Uh, yeah. We've got delta x equals 1. So can you all see the, the graph that's showing up? Zach, why does it make sense that this is a step function? Um, what do you mean, why does it make sense? Well, why, why should we not be surprised that it's a step function? Um, because it has a constant rate over certain intervals. Okay, and where does that constant rate come from? I mean, this graphing calculator is just doing calculations and and plotting, right? Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what about the calculations is it doing that makes the step function? Well, dividing the accumulation function into portions of delta x and then finding the, I guess, slope of that. All right, so, yeah. And if you look up here at this calculation, okay, let's look at Let's look at R of point 0.1. Okay. R of point 0.1 is 1. Why does that make sense? Well, I'll put that question on hold. R of point 0.2 is 1. R of point 0.3 is 1. R of point 0.4 is 1. 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. This they're all 1. If the value of r is 1 throughout that interval, what kind of graph will it produce? A step function. A step function. It'll be constant throughout that interval, right? And then I say r of 1. Oh, it's 3. Why is it 3? And not 1 anymore. Victoria? Why was it point, why was it one all the way up until we get to x equals one and now all of a sudden r is value of three? Because it's a uh, the left endpoint like changed almost? Precisely. Very good. The left endpoint, so if we look at left of x, we're starting at negative one hundred. So and delta x is one, so these delta x intervals start at negative one hundred. Where's the at negative 100? Where's the next left point, left end point? Starting at negative 100, the delta x equals one. Jessica, where's the next left end? Negative 99. Yeah, and the one after that, Zach. Negative 98. Eventually, it'll be zero, right? So, what's f? Delta x is one, right? Left of x is when x is When x is 0.6, what's left of x? Tau? Just left of x. What's left of x when x is 0 0.6? When x is? When x is 0 0.6. Uh, it's negative 99. No, that would be if, it were, if x were way back by negative 100. X is 0 0.6. What delta x interval is it in? Starting where, ending where? John? Uh, starting between the 0 and 1. 0 and 1. Starts at 0, ends at 1. OK. So what's left of 0.6? Down. 0. Yes. So it's left of 0.6, which is 0, and delta x is 1. 
So this is f of 1, right? What's f of 1? 1. Left of x is 0. What's f of 0? 0. 1 minus 0 divided by 1 gives us 1. Okay, so you see how it's working? Now, I'm going to make delta x smaller. I'm going to make delta x a little more than two-thirds. Okay? Now it's a little bit harder to mentally figure out where these intervals start and end, right? So let's just, so, uh, we can answer in principle. We don't have to answer in specific numbers. R of 0.6, now it says it's 1.4037. Where does that come from? Niels? You don't have to give specific numbers. You can just sort of answer in principle. So it uses the R of X function and plugs 0.6 into it. And it solves right. it out. Okay, so but and tell me what it does now. So it finds number intervals. Um. Yeah, between negative 100 and 0.6. Actually, what you can say is it just finds the left hand point of the interval that 0.6 is in. In fact, I'll help you there. The left end point of the interval that 0.6 is in is 0.7168. So what does it do with that number? Tori? It plugs it into the equation up there. So what will be left x plus delta x? It will be the point three seven one six eight plus point six six zero three four. Right. Another way to put that is it's the right end point of the interval. Or that. Or that. <laughs> So it's f evaluated at the right end point of the interval minus f evaluated at the left end of the interval. What does that difference give us, Zochi? It will give us r of x. No, not that. It won't just, I'm asking just what will this difference give us? Oh. Just that difference. this difference give us? Change in x interval? Say that again? The change in x interval? Uh, no, actually this gives us the change in x. Oh, um, the change in x. Let me draw a diagram for you. Okay. Suppose that this is um, 0.6, f of 0.6. Suppose this is 0.6, oh, I'm sorry, this is not 0.6, this is 11. So left of 0.6 and f of left of 0.6. In other words, this is the point that we get from, I guess I should go over here someplace. Um, this is the point that we get when we put 0.6 into F, well, into the numerator bar. And then th over here, let's say that, okay. so this Y value is, F of left of 0.6. Suppose that now over here, this is left of 0.6 plus delta x. 
That's the x value. What's the y value? At the left, or point six plus. Is the plus inside or outside the, or, uh, the parentheses for that? Like, is it going to be this plus point six, or is it going to be that plus point six? It's outside. It's outside of? Of the parentheses. Well, it's outside of the left parentheses. Is it outside of the F parentheses? No. Okay. That was, yes. Okay. What is this right here? Josh, what is that that I just highlighted? Yeah, f of left of, of 0.6 plus delta x. Uh, well, that's part of the story. Tasna, you want to finish the story? Um, is it the change in y? It's the change in y. And you get the change in y, how, Zach? Um, by doing the numerator of the r of x. Exactly, by doing the numerator of the r of x. That's what this is right there. That's the numerator of r of x. The numerator of r of x is the difference in the, there's the change in y, okay, over that interval. That's how much the value of the function changed over that interval. Okay, is that clear now, Zochi? Okay. Okay, so we can call it delta y, and delta y you would calculate it by looking at the difference in the values of the function at the left hand point, right hand. So we, we're clear on why this is a step function. It's because every value in the numerators could be the same for every value of x within a delta x interval. That difference is going to be the same for every value of x in that within that <coughs> delta x interval. Right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make delta x smaller. Okay? Now, watch closely. Can, uh, that's kind of hard to see. Um, maybe, is it easier to see if I make it red? That's the same. Okay, look at what happened to the graph. What I want to do is I want to see what difference is the value of A make. Because we just picked 100, right? I mean, negative 100. Let's see what difference the value of A makes. What, do you, what difference do you think it's going to make? I don't think it's going to make any difference. Why do you think that's that? Um, I'm not sure because you're just choosing a different beginning. Can you speak point. up? I'm sure Abby can hear you. Uh, because you're choosing a different beginning point, which shouldn't affect the overall graph. Just okay. When we're looking at so is that, uh, Abby, did you hear what he said? Yeah. Okay. So Abby, if we're looking at the rate of change over this tiny interval. And that tiny interval is just an interval of length delta x that starts some multiple from a, then how is changing a going to affect it? I don't think it would affect it because it's still the same change in x. Okay. Yeah, these are all good examples. Bernard? Doesn't that only affect the accumulation function? Say more. Like, uh, that's just where you start accumulating, right? But that's the they will change function, so I don't see how that's going to affect Okay, Casey? It'll change the step function because it changes where it takes the rate of, like, what slope it has. So for each step function, like, it could be in a different place because the average rate of change could be different in that interval. Okay. Uh, here, so we can, I'm going to make delta this big again, all right? Now, watch what happens as I make as I change A, and think about why 
why that graph behaves like it does as I change the beginning of the accumulation. What's it doing? Nothing. Why not? Because delta x is 1, and so it, it's not going to change that way, whereas if de delta x is smaller, it would change. Yeah, in this particular case, that's right, Casey. In this particular case, delta x is 1, and I'm changing a in increments of, of 1. So there will be a different number of delta x intervals from a to 0, but you'll always have a delta x interval starting at 0. Let me make delta x a little different, okay? Now, okay, it seems to make a little bit of a difference, all right? Does it make? Does it make? What, what difference does it make? What's shifting from left to right? Like where the where that constant rate of change is. And you mean like in space or where, like where it is out there in the plane or you mean in that space? I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, now I want everybody to understand and for the audio record, Jordan's holding her fingers up with a slight gap between them and saying the difference that it makes is in that space, <laughs> right? So it sounds like you're talking about the x-axis. No, 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 no. I, it's fine to be talking about the x-axis because that's where a is and that's where delta x is. A and delta x are all in the x-axis. <coughs> so all we're doing, okay, all we're doing is, all right, suppose that we start off with delta x here. Uh, here's a, a delta x here. Suppose that I push A to the right a little bit. What's he going to do with that delta X? Pardon me? It's going to push it to the right. Now, there's another delta X interval over here. I keep going to the wrong path. Okay, there's another delta X interval over here. Okay. If I push A to, if, if I slide A to the right, a distance of delta X, What's going to happen? It's not going to look like it changed. It's not going to look like it changed. You'll still have a delta x interval where you had one before. So, now watch. Let's see here. Okay, so here's our delta x interval now. I'm going to change a well, shoot. I don't want to change A in increments of 1, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Okay, so here's the delta x interval. Here's the next delta x interval. So here's one delta x interval. There's another. Now I'm going to push A to the right a little bit. Why did Why did the graph seem to move? Because it changes left of x. It changes left of x. Precisely. How wide is the delta x interval now? It's still the same. It's still the same. Suppose I push A to the right a little bit more. And a little bit more. 
Oh, what do we have? Now we have the same thing we had before. So the most difference it can make is that it can shift the graph a little bit to the right at most delta x, because after that it starts repeating itself. So if I make delta x really, really small, and I vary the value of a, then it's really not going to have any negligible effect, especially if I make delta x really small, except then the graphic calculator can't handle it and we don't see any. So a way out of that is, I'm really what we're interested in is when delta x is really, really small, right? And since a doesn't make any difference, we don't have to use left. We can just use the value of x. So I'm going to make that change. Instead of left x, I'm just going to say x. Now we're not using left x. And, oh, and also we don't, remember why we had this, this if clause in there? Because of the calculator drill. To stop the calculator drill, right. So now we don't have to worry about calculator drill. So this is what we get when delta x is microscopically small. Now we get something that is effectively a smooth function. So even though we were doing left x and all of that to conform to what we used to do in, with accumulation functions, now it's like we're at uh, or we're near to an exact rate of change function because we're using extremely small values of delta x. Now, let me switch over, because what we're talking about here is the idea of limit, OK? Now, I'll bet you those of you who are at calculus have been nervous that we haven't talked about limits, and everybody else has talked about limits. But we were talking about limits the whole time. We've talked about limits all semester. A limit is just what you get when you let delta x be super, super small. So the other aspect of limit is that you've got a never-ending sequence. Can you tell what's going on there? Where, where is this picture being taken from? Well, in an elevator, but I mean, where is the girl standing in this picture? To the left. She's standing over here? No, she's standing. No, she's standing. Uh, That's right, she's standing over here. That's her first image. So, that's her first image, and then there's an image there, and then it just keeps bouncing around, and you get this never ending sequence, right? And it's never ending. Conceptually, it's never ending. Now, clearly, you have a loss of, of luminance with every round of reflection. And so eventually, the luminance is going to get so small that you can't see anything. Even if it were large enough to see, it would be too dim to see. And so the, I, I'm going on a digression because I want to come back to the idea of limit with regard to rate of change. But here I just want to talk about the idea of limit. So do you agree or disagree? If the symbols A and B represent different real numbers, then it's always possible to find a number between them. Agree or disagree? How many? It's not a trick. I want you to, how many agree? Fascinating, you're not sure? <laughs> All right. You're just naturally a skeptic, right? <laughs> so 
So agree or dis disagree? If the symbols A and B each represent a real number, and if it is impossible to find a number between them, then those letters actually stand for the represent the same number. How many agree? Tori's thinking of a number, she's calling it A. Miles is thinking of a number, he's calling it B. And we try to guess numbers between them, and whatever number we guess, and I'm not saying the spectrum, okay? But if we find it, it is impossible to find a number between A and B, what do we have to conclude about their numbers? They're the same. If it's impossible to find a number between A and B, then A and B have to represent the same number. Okay? So this unending sequence of nines, <coughs> nine tenths plus nine one hundredths plus nine one thousandths plus nine ten thousandths plus nine hundred thousandths, going on forever. Does that represent a number? Can you find a number between the number represented by this symbol and the number represented by that symbol? Somebody propose a candidate. Yes. Okay, what? Abby, can you think of one? A candidate, not, not an answer, but a candidate. The first number just keeps going on forever. Okay. Suppose that somebody says, oh, I know, put 100 points, put point 0.9 and then 100 nines and then 1. That number is between this one and 1. Will that work? Zach? No, because the, it's never ending. So then that would even be less than. Yeah, so we could go and just say, okay, well, go 0.9 more. Where you have a 1, put a 9. Now it's not in between this 0.9999 and 1. It's outside, it's to the left of the 0.99. So whatever number you propose, you can be able to go out far enough to get enough, enough 9s so that you'll say, no, sorry, doesn't work. It's not between this number and 1. What do we have to conclude? That they're the same number. We have to conclude that point nine 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 forever and one are two symbols that represent the same number. We're forced into it because it's impossible to find a number between them. So we're forced to say that point nine 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 and so on equals one. They both represent the same number. Now, does that does that have a funny feeling to it for you? We always have to conclude that 0.999 will always approach infinity. Well, that's what this is meant to represent. Yeah, if you stop it at some point, if you stop it after 10 million nines, then you can find a number between that and one. But this is this says no. This is not stop at any finite number of nines. So the way that we represent that mathematically, remember I said this 0.999 is 9 tenths plus 9 one plus 9 one thousandths plus 9 ten thousandths, etc. That, and we go out to n places, that the limit as n goes to infinity is 1. And that's the mathematical way of saying this. That there's no number between 0.999 indefinitely and 1. See, that's that, that, that's what this idea of limit is, that there's you, no space between what the number that this stands for and the number that that stands for. There's no number between them. So now let's come back to our area function, okay? <coughs> we said that uh, the rate of change of area with respect to change in side length the average rate of change over an interval of length delta x is calculated by this formula. 
Okay, this is just the difference in y divided by the difference in x. So it's the constant rate of change, or it's the average rate of change over some interval of length delta x. Now let's just do a little algebra. Okay. So if we expand that, you know, if we expand x plus delta x squared, this is what we get. And you can see that find this. see is that this x squared and that x squared, when we do the algebra, we get zero. So what we end up with is 2x plus delta x. That's what, so when we were calculating the average rate of change over this interval, this in effect is the number that we were getting, 2x plus delta x. Suppose that we let delta x be really small, like one, one, one hundred trillion. Then what about if delta x is one one hundred trillion? And I wish I could be writing on there, but I can't. Then what about this? When x is five and delta x is one one trillion, what, what will we have? X is five. Yes. I mean, I guess you could say it's just ten. It's effectively ten, right? It's ten plus one. What did I say? A hundred trillion or something? Yeah. So it's effectively it's ten. It, it'll be ten. So this is effectively two x. And that's the way that we'll say that two x plus delta x, where I should qualify that. 2x plus delta x, this equals with a dot over it. We're going to use that to say is essentially equal to. In other words, for extremely small values of delta x, there's really no difference. So 2x plus delta x is essentially equal to 2x for sufficiently small x. If I come back here and I'm going to graph y equals 2x. What do you notice? They're the same, aren't they? So without even knowing it, you know, we thought that we were graphing this quotient. But in effect, we were graphing y equals 2x. So we say that the rate of change of x squared at any value of x is effectively 2x. That's what we've, that's what we've just established. So what we established was that that quotient, which we used to define the rate of change of x squared over intervals of length delta x, is effectively, is essentially equal to 2x for any value of x. So that means that the values of these two expressions are essentially equal for small values of x, uh, delta x. Both expressions produce essentially the same number for sufficiently small values of delta x. There's no number between those two expressions if we let delta x approach zero. Okay, so all of this is just another way to talk about this, what people make a huge deal about when they talk about limits. They're just saying that you've got two ways of representing 
a number, and they're essentially equal to each other. Essentially, they both represent the same number. And that would be written in conventional notation as I put in uh, line four. So there's no number between uh, these two expressions. So choose a value for x, pick a number you think is between them, and you can find a small enough value of delta x to put it in the Just like when Brick thought that he had a number between 0.99999 and 1, we can find one of what? To, make, to, to show that it's not. Well, this is saying the same thing. That if anybody claims that there's a number between this expression and the 2x for a particular value of x, you can find the value of delta x is small enough to say, sorry, you're wrong. There's no number between them. Therefore, what do we have to conclude? In the limit, they're the same number. For a specific value of delta x, they're not the same number. But this is saying that in the limit, meaning somebody picks a number that they think is between those two, then you go find a value of delta x that makes that false. <coughs> See, you have to let delta x adjust in order to uh, to show that the number they picked can't be between those two expressions. Alright, so that's the conventional notation. Now I'm going to come back to I'm going to try and do something really quickly. Okay. Oh, I forgot to make this big. <coughs> the value of A doesn't matter with respect to the graph of R of X for small values of delta X. Now we also did an example of a cube, I mean, a sphere expanding. It could have been a cube. We did a sphere that expanded. What's V of X? Quickly, someone. function that gives you an amount, think of it as an accumulation function. When you open your textbook, it's just going to say, here's a function. The first thing you need to say is, it's an accumulation function. R of x is what, Casey? Um, it's the rate of change of, of the function v of x over a certain. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's say, speak in terms of what things stand for. So it's a rate of change of volume. Okay. Uh, it's rate of change of the sphere's volume as the you know, over the interval. What interval? Um, delta x. Uh, no, that's how wide it is. What's the interval? Um, where does it start? And where does it end? Zero to x. No. Look up at the rate of change function. This is saying it's a change from oh. x to x plus delta x. Okay. okay. Now. Here's what I'm going to do real quickly. I'm going to do it real quickly, so pay attention. I'm going to, instead of, I mean, we could say uh, we can graph y equals r of x, we could get a graph of a function uh, for a small value of delta x and so on. But I'm going to do this. I'm going to actually write out this expression. So it's going to be 4 thirds, and I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, I'm going to factor out the 4 thirds. Um, you're going to factor out the 4 thirds pi. 
uh, and it'll be uh, 4 thirds pi times x plus delta x cubed. Minus x cubed. Okay. Is that you see what I'm doing? Because this would just be four thirds x plus delta x cubed minus four thirds pi x cubed. And so I just did a little algebra ahead of time. So the graphing calculator could do that for me. Okay. Now. Um, let's see, I can factor out a delta x, can't I? Each of these terms has a delta x, so I can use the distributive property to factor out delta x. That's all I did, is I just factored out delta x. See what's left? Now, I'm going to copy this and bring it down so that we can keep a record of the steps that we're going through. Uh, we have delta x times all this divided by 3 times delta x. Well, I can get rid of these. Right? And it's 3 divided by all of these, so let's see. I mean, it's all of these divided by 3, so that will be 4 pi x squared uh, plus 4 pi x delta x plus or thirds pi delta x squared, and that will take care of the three here. Okay? Now, if we let delta x be really, really, really small, what will this be essentially equal to? 4 pi x squared. 4 pi x squared. So, let's look at. y equals 4 pi, I, I don't want to grab these things. Let's look at 4 pi x squared. Well, first let's look at uh, y equals r of x, okay? <coughs> so there's um, y equals r of x. Now let's look at y equals 4 pi x squared. So we're going to do the same thing. If we make, as they're essentially the same thing. If I make delta x even smaller, or smaller yet, then they become essentially the same thing. So as we do the, the lesson here, and I'm sorry that I've kept you five, five minutes over time. The lesson here is that if we look at this in terms of okay, what's happening with regard to this difference quotient, as we let delta x get really small, we end up with something in closed form. We end up with something that, you know, that we can just say, okay, f of x is equal to this, then it's a rate of change function. Okay. So I'm going to post up some stuff where you're going to practice expanding a rate of change function to see what it looks like in closed form. Okay. Ready? One, two, three, go.